Jeff McCullough, who is our third co-conspirator when it comes to the workshop on health IT and economics. Uh, Jeff Gordon and I have uh, worked closely together for the last seven years on this workshop. So Gordon, please. Thanks, Ritu. And uh, let me join Ritu in welcoming everyone uh, and for old friends coming back and uh, for new faces, right, hopefully we'll join our big family, you know, through the years. Uh, so it's my, it's our great honor to uh, have Dr. Lisa Simpson as our opening keynote speaker at White this year. So uh, Dr. Simpson is uh, the president and the CEO of Academy Health. She's a nationally recognized uh, scholar and a thought leader, you know, in health services research. So she has published uh, over 80, you know, papers right in peer-reviewed journals. And over the years, Dr. Simpson has served many influential roles in various positions, such as, uh, you know, the, uh, the director of uh, Child Policy Center uh, at uh, Cincinnati's Children uh, Hospital, as well as a professor of pediatrics right, at the University of Cincinnati at that time. And uh, then, uh, so she also served as the deputy director of HRQ, and also several uh, programs, right, from uh, Robert Woods Johnson. So, uh, so Dr. Simpson was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2013. So it's really, really our great, great honor to, to have her today. And please join me in welcoming her. Good morning. Okay, let me get my slide deck up here. Right, while that's being pulled up, okay, how many of you consider yourselves data scientists? And you can be more than one of these questions. How many of you consider yourselves health services researchers? Oh, yay. Okay, now, now, okay, how many of you are members of Academy Health? Bad. <laughs> <laughs> and how many of you um, are more in the, uh, what's the other category? Okay, what if I not called out? A lot of hands went up, but several didn't. Oh, that's a nice way. Okay, so how many of you are clinically prepared in some discipline to care for people? Okay, great. And, and all the rest of you take care of numbers. Well, you know what they say about statistics, you know, numbers. If you torture them enough, they'll admit to anything. So, um, all right. Well, good morning. It's really wonderful to be here, and I want to thank Gordon for the invitation. Um, I got to meet him last uh, May at the uh, Health Data Palooza, and so it's really a pleasure to be here. So I'm gonna, is this working? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Um, sometimes I usually hear an echo. So I wanna focus on a few key trends and priorities, and so this is sort of the, the world according to Lisa, so it's very much in a few minutes, just some highlights, and I'd love um, to engage you in some Q&A um, at the end of this. So I, to, as I thought about my talk, I went to your conference goal. What is the goal of this workshop? And so it's to deepen the understanding of health IT design and its impact and to stimulate new ideas with both policy and business implications. And increasingly in our field of health services research and the membership of Academy Health, we're seeing um, a shift from a dominantly academically based um, membership and field to one that is much more diverse in its employment settings with um, uh, about 45, 50% academic, 45% private sector in all kinds of different settings and then pretty stable around 10% in government. So um, this, this is a great uh, meeting and I'm glad to be here. So um, since you're not members of Academy Health, I'll tell you a little bit about this because it colors what I think and which trends and priorities we're focused on. So we are the Professional Society for Health Services Research. We have over 4,000 members. And I wanna just highlight these two part, parts of our vision and mission that our work is squarely focused on evidence to inform uh, policy and practice. I am a pediatrician by training, and while I've done my own research, I continue to do research, what really gets me up in the morning is the ability to use that evidence, to use the findings to make things better. So, um, and, and that's what animates uh, Academy Health, is that focus on translation, as well as supporting the science of health services research. So when we talk about evidence in our mission, and we just had a, a all-day workshop yesterday on the health services research workforce of the future, and this was interesting because people were saying, well, we, you know, it's so much broader than research. And in fact, we talk about evidence uh, much more often than we talk about research. 
And this is just, I'm not going to go through these uh, components, but it's very broad. And increasingly, this changing data ecosystem is one we're very focused on uh, because data is the lifeblood of research. You can't do research without data. And so we're really working very much with colleagues around the country to help uh, understand how to appropriately leverage all these new data streams which can be used to help understand both uh, health and healthcare and hopefully improve it. So we do three things at Academy Health. We work with our members, um, but both research producers and users. We advance the science of health services research and policy research, focus very much on methods and data, and then we focus on the translation. And um, have we have several conferences. I mentioned I met uh, Gordon at the Health Data Palooza. Some of you may be focused on dissemination and implementation science. If you're funded by the NIH, there's an annual conference related to that. There's our National Health Policy Conference, the Data Palooza. We became the hosts of this uh, event this past year, and we're doing it again. And the call for session proposals is live. So if you want to submit a, a concept for to do a session, please uh, submit. And then our annual research meeting is our sort of jewel in our crown with over um, this past uh, year in June in Boston, we had over 2,900 attendees. Um, how many of you have been to a Data Palooza event? Okay, so some of you. So this is a really different kind of, you know, going from the annual research meeting, which is sort of the premier health services research meeting, to then the Data Palooza, it's a very different crowd. Um, it's, it's a lot of startups, a lot of private sector, a lot of public policy. It's focused on, how many of you have seen Todd Park speak? Okay, so those of you, you know how he goes, data liberacion, you know, let's liberate the data and use it to develop all kinds of applications and systems um, and innovations to improve healthcare in this country. Um, and so we had a, an amazing lineup. What's not on this photo from this last year is that we were very fortunate to have Vice President Biden come speak very eloquently and directly to the audience about the role of data sharing in health, uh, drawing on his experience uh, with his son's illness and ultimately um, death, uh, Bo uh, Biden. So, and then we have journals, um, and you're probably familiar with HSR and Health Affairs. They are our, our first two official journals, but I'm going to tell you a little bit more about eGEMS because I'd love to have more uh, authors from this crowd submitting to eGEMS. How many of you have ever heard of eGEMS? Okay, just a couple. So it's a, it's a different kind of journal, so I'll, I'll get to that towards the end. So now that you know a little bit more about sort of the background of what we do at Academy Health and what we're focused on, um, that sets the stage for what we are focused on in terms of trends and priorities for our field. So there are trends affecting health services research. Um, and you might be feeling different trends, but these are at least some of the ones that we see. Um, the demand for more timely, relevant research while still maximizing rigor. And it's that balance of sort of what's the, the design and the data and the analytic methods that are fit for purpose. Who's asking the question and how soon do they need the answer? And the pace of change and transformation and innovation has accelerated to such an extent that the traditional sort of health services research academic model is, I think, being very much challenged and threatened about, you know, you can't take just four to five years to do your research and then come up with your results. We need answers much more quickly. And so I think that's really pushing the field to think differently about its uh, approach to research. We're also seeing much more demand for consumer patient and other stakeholder involvement. This started before the PCORI's establishment, but PCORI has really catapulted that uh, into the forefront. So how many of you have got any PCORI funding? Ah, oh, you guys should apply. You know, they have a whole priority around, you know, the infrastructure for research, and they have funded quite a few data-related activities. I'll touch on one of them later. Um, obviously, the policy imperatives. High tech got us all launched um, and, you know, pushed everybody towards meaningful use. Um, uh, but of course, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act and the most recent legislation, MACRA, is really stressing the system, hopefully pushing us all in the right direction. But as Don Berwick, quoting, I think Paul Batalden might have been the first person to say this, which is, all improvement is change, not all change is improvement. And we're seeing a lot of change right now, driven by these policy changes. Um, but again, I think we're, we're, we're still trying to sift through and understand what of that change is actually making things better for patients, for systems, uh, reducing costs, improving value. And that takes me to the next one, which is very much the focus on value. 
um, the, you know, not just the volume to value policy conversation and the change in the payment systems, but it, at every step of the way, um, the increasing exposure of consumers to copays and deductibles in their insurance coverage, everybody wants to make sure that they're getting, you know, the Goldilocks care, not too much, not too little, just right value, good quality care for the lowest cost. And I think that's really driving the research community increasingly. And we launched with the ABIM Foundation a research community on low value care just this past spring um, where we're doing webinars and convening researchers to really try to accelerate and learn from each other. You know, how do you use electronic data to identify low value care? Because it's all about appropriate. My low value care may not be low value for you. So how do you tease out at the much more granular clinical level what is low value care for a specific patient? And then even if you're able to do that from electronic health data, how do you actually incorporate patient values and preferences into that um, you know, sort of judgment about what is low value? And then clearly a focus on innovation at Academy Health. We ourselves have run some challenges with Health 2.0. Um, we have an innovation track at our annual research meeting. Data Palooza was a very intentional, the acquisition of the Data Palooza was very intentional in terms of getting our field of health services research more connected to the innovation space, to the startup space, um, so that we're bringing the evidence that our field produces to the front lines of innovation and that we're learning from the innovators about how to do our research in different and new ways. Now, um, I saw that this is my, that I'm the policy plenary. So, you know, and I focused on some key policy trends. And when we think about where policy is made, who's making these decisions, we tend to think, you know, we're in Washington, so we're th we think we're the center of the universe. And so, you know, for anybody outside of Washington, and I was here for, uh, Gordon mentioned, uh, I was deputy director at ARC, and prior to that, I, I worked in the assistant secretary's office. So I was a, Washing a denizen of Washington for nine years, and then I left and was a full-time academic for eight years, four years at University of South Florida, and then at Cincinnati. And you know, the rest of the world out there really don't pay attention to DC that much most of the time, or they try to really avoid paying attention. So I always like to remind us in the bubble here that um, this is not the real world. But policy is clearly made increasingly and uh, recently in Washington. But I've also worked very much at the state level. And as we think about the intersection of health IT and innovation and transformation, the states are key players um, in either helping accelerate this or really, you know, kind of stymieing um, the, the widespread transformation. So, you know, whether you're talking about telehealth and state licensing laws or, um, you know, the SIM uh, models and other, I worked very much, uh, I, oh God, and remember the ill-fated Rios? So I was medical director of the Tampa Bay Rio when we were doing that in the early 2000s. Um, when I was in Cincinnati, uh, worked with Peter Emby and others on the Beacon community that we had. Uh, in Cincinnati. So there have been all kinds of phases and m more as a pediatrician also states really need to focus on health IT for kids because we have a different system of care and that's quite a bit behind. So states are really important to the policy making process for health IT. But then I always like to remind folks that policy is also very much driven by the private sector. There's so much, so many decisions are made in boardrooms in policy that affect sometimes far more individuals than public policy does. I was maternal and child health director for the state of Hawaii for three years, and even if I did my job tremendously well and improved, you know, the health of women and children, that's still only, at the time, it was about 600, you know, 600,000 women, because this whole state has only 1.2 million. How many covered lives does United Healthcare have these days? And, you know, with all these mega mergers, you're talking major potential impact on uh, systems of care, financing, and ultimately, we hope, health outcomes. So to think about other trends and priorities it, specific to data, I turn to the EDM Forum Review. Now, Academy Health is in the tail phase of its ARC-funded Electronic Data Methods Forum project. We've been doing this for the last six years. It was high-tech dollars that came out. How many of you have ever heard of the EDM Forum? Okay, a couple, yeah. Um, and so um, this EDM Forum Review, it's on our website, it's interactive, um, but the Ele Electronic Data Methods Forum is, uh, was our opportunity to really jumpstart other work that we were also doing in the data space and convene eventually a community of over 4,000 individuals around the country, multiple projects, and fund additional collaborative projects across the members of the community focused on such things as data quality. Michael Kahn working 
on data quality issues. Right now, there's a collaborative project focused on palliative care and uh, advanced directives and all the data around the interoperability and uh, sharing of those uh, across settings. So a lot of collaborative work, and I'm going to touch on some of the, the activities that we're continuing on even as the ARC money has ended. So here are the four trends in this EDM forum review. It's the third one that was published um, that were identified by the review. Um, the implementation of the quality payment program, unprecedented investments in science at scale, an increasing role for community-based data sharing, and the movement towards open science. So in terms of the first one, um, I'm going to say the least about that. Um, because the new regs just came out, you know, the final regs after all the commentary. Um, I, I, I don't know if you've seen Don Berwick has really challenged the, what some call the measurement industrial complex um, to, you know, get rid of, you know, 25 to 50 percent of existing measures that are just crippling practice settings uh, in uh, just how much gets reported by who to so many different players. Um, but I think that there's, you know, with anything that's this much change, some will be improvements, some won't be, and it's going to be incredibly disruptive in the, in the path along the way. So stay tuned as this plays out, and maybe you'll be part of seeing, making it play out. So turning to the second one, uh, unprecedented science at scale, the EDM Forum Review identified these four big buckets, um, and some of you may be particularly involved in one versus another. But clearly, the, the launch of the PMI, the Precision Medicine Initiative, the appointment of Eric Dishman, I think there's just going to be some really interesting uh, trends, and that's really going to push science at scale. Really, how do we do this at a much greater level and get beyond the sort of R01 independent investigator teams to really big science? Um, and there's some very interesting risk management approaches in there uh, that they're proposing for data security and privacy. Turning from that, the PCORnet. Any of you working with PCORnet as an invent? Okay, so uh, all of you know what PCORnet is? Okay, um, so PCORnet is funded by PCORI, and it's a bold attempt to, again, do science differently, as the motto of PCORI is research done differently. Um, and it combines clinical um, data research networks and patient powered research networks. So the CDRNs, the PPRNs, put together into this massive network of networks um, to harmonize their protocols and do, again, research science at scale. And they've um, most recently funded uh, a proposal, well, they're, they're doing, uh, they've been doing the ADAPT trial around aspirin dosing. There's some focus on childhood obesity across sites. But most recently, just this past summer, they talked about how now they're going to create this front door where other investigators who aren't funded PCORnet investigators can ask, you know, ask for, apply for access to their data resources uh, or request for collaboration or um, to have their study designated as a PCORnet study. Now, how much support that gives you, I'm not exactly sure, but you should look at that. That's, uh, I think, an interesting um, next step for PCORnet. Now, PCORI's money uh, runs out in 2020 in terms of new boluses of money coming from their funding stream. They're an unusual uh, entity uh, created by the Affordable Care Act with not appropriated dollars, not mandatory dollars in the traditional sense like Medicare and Medicaid, but with mandatory dollars coming from a tax on every covered life by health plans. So the health plans pay for, the most, for most of this money. So it's $600 million a year transferred from the Treasury, and it's a private not-for-profit. So it's a very interesting funding model, and uh, it comes up for reauthorization in 2019. So the question is, will it be reauthorized in 2019? And all bets are off till November 9th, right? Um, so that's all I'll say about the election. <laughs> so um, the, the third trend, trend in science at scale is the issue of big data. And most of you have probably seen that hype curve and big data is, you know, right at the top of the hype curve. It's going to solve all our problems. Isn't it fabulous? Well, um, we'll see. But the reality is that um, there's a lot of investment in this. And we have our colleague here, Mark, from the first uh, uh, organization listed there, Optum Labs. Ooh, a typo in Watson Health. My apologies. Anybody here from Watson? 
Yay, okay. And, um, you know, uh, they acquired Truven. Uh, I was just talking to Bill Martyr yesterday. So some important, um, you know, uh, uh, well, what's the right term? Uh, positioning, you know, reshuffling of the deck of who controls which data assets out there in the private sector, and some pretty major commitments to, to be a winner in this big data arms race, so to speak. Merck is doing some interesting work as well, particularly around clinical trials globally. Um, and then um, Alphabet getting re sort of jiggered and, and named Verily. So these are just a couple of some very interesting shifts in the private sector in terms of real investments in the potential for big data. Uh, and then, of course, the cancer moonshot. I mentioned Vice President Biden. Uh, they just released a report on the progress on the cancer moonshot. You know, it's always hard in the last year of an administration to say you're going to do something bold because you have so little time left. And so they've been very focused on the role of data in trying to support, uh, you know, progress towards uh, addressing cancer. So, um, you know, some, some pretty bold statements. How much of this continues with the new administration is up for, um, you know, anybody to guess at this point. Turning from that, I want to talk about the community-based data sharing and leadership trend that we're seeing and that we're very actively involved in. I mentioned the Beacon communities when I was in Cincinnati. Then when I came to Academy Health in 2011, we actually ended up, we were partnered with both um, Brookings as well as uh, with support directly from the Commonwealth Fund. We worked with the 16 Beacon communities to try to help particularly those who didn't have linkages with the health services research community. And you know, we, the first exercise we did with the communities was, could you show us your logic model for, and your theory of change of how you're going to take all this data and make health better in your community? And most, you know, some of them were like, what's a logic model? So you know, we had some work to do with some of those sites. Um, but it was really um, very, I think, we think we heard really great feedback from the Beacon communities about how helpful it was to connect them with experts in evaluation, in monitoring and measurement to really try to get at what difference they're making. Um, but here's just a list of some of the um, initiatives. Again, the state innovation models, a number of them are trying to work around community-based data sharing. Um, uh, uh, we're, we're seeing the new accountable health communities coming out of CMMI as well, with the focus, several of them, on data across sectors. Um, HRSA has funded a, a big emphasis on telehealth. Um, and then I want to tell you a little bit more about the Community Health Peer Learning Program that is funded by the Office of the National Coordinator um, and that we are the National Program Office for. And so um, we're working very closely with the National Partnership and um, we selected, you know, did an RFP for communities who wanted to work on data sharing to address population health. And what I find really unique about this is that we had 10 geographic participant communities, but also five communities of subject matter experts. So they're not doing stuff in their community, but they're bringing their subject matter expertise as uh, resources to the geographic communities as they're tackling the issues that they're, they're grappling with. Um, and so the, the mission of this program is to support a cross-sector data movement uh, to address social determinants of health, to stimulate and support peer learning collaboration, and obviously to build the evidence base for multi-sector data use to improve health. And at the same time that we were um, launching this program last year, um, the um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded another initiative, the DASH, which is Data Across Sectors for Health. Again, focused on leveraging data from sectors other than traditional health care data or public health data to address health. So that's talk we're talking housing, transportation, all kinds of other sectors um, to try to bring that data together. And so we then partnered with the DASH team. It's run by Peter Eckhart. Um, and, um, and so you see here that the, in total across these two uh, projects, we have 20, 25 uh, local projects working on data across sectors. So I think that's a big push. We're going to learn a lot from these communities. Um, and I have a lot more information, but I'm just showing you this one descriptive just to give you a sense of the types of data uh, sources that these communities are trying to leverage. But they're focused on things like birth outcomes, homelessness, um, trying to think, you know, multiple chronic conditions, uh, lots of different thorny or what, what folks sometimes call wicked problems um, in population health and trying to figure out how to use these different data streams to, to change care and address challenges. 
Academy Health also does many other communities of practice. It's sort of one of our jobs we see to help, you know, in, for our goals of advancing the science of health services research is to bring uh, cutting edge researchers and innovators together to learn from each other so that we can accelerate um, the progress we're making in generating relevant evidence. So coming out of the Electronic Data Methods Forum, we launched two communities of practice, population health community of practice and data and analytics in a learning health system. The one on the left, PopCop, um, is working with uh, city and state health departments who are doing innovations, not just with their traditional public health data sources, but working with electronic health data, with other types of data, and trying to make um, the you know, much more use of the data streams that they have access to. The next trend I want to mention, the last trend, um, is open science. And so this, um, you know, obviously we're all uh, talking about open science and the conversation around open science was really, uh, you know, kind of rose to much broader conversation when Jeff Drazen and his colleague wrote uh, his uh, piece in the New England Journal uh, calling on people who used other people's data when it was shared, research parasites, right? So that caused a huge backlash and he had to, you know, clarify what they meant um, because it's clearly if you're really going to do open science and share your data, um, it, it disrupts the traditional academic model of research where you acquire your data, you generate your data, you, you, you get your data set and then you mine it till the cows co come home and that's your you know, ticket to tenure. Um, and if you're actually putting it out there, um, you know, it just changes given all the, it, the incentives uh, that aren't changing in an academic setting. Um, you know, we have to really be thoughtful about how we move to open science. Um, but we at Academy Health are very committed to this. Um, so, and I'm gonna talk about eGEMS as part of our commitment, but the other aspect is team science. And I, I mentioned uh, the workforce conference we just did yesterday at our uh, offices. And so we were looking again at core competencies for health services research. Uh, there, was a, there were commission papers across different aspects of the workforce and health services research. And one was um, looking at the demand of employers. What do they want from health services research? And across the board in every commission paper, the issue of working in teams and the soft skills and the shift from this sort of independent investigators to project work and teamwork was very dominant across all of the conversation yesterday. So I think it's something that is affecting, you know, is something we're very focused on in, in looking at science of the future. And then finally, eGEMS is the journal I mentioned. Oh. Let me, before I turn to eGEMS, we also um, are working with NORC. Um, the patient, PCOR has established a resource center for data infrastructure, and we're working with them to, uh, to do this. And all of the EDM form, um, more than 400 reports, data objects, other things that are in the directory, et cetera, is all going to be part of the PCOR Resource Center, so they're going to live on. So I'm hoping that as this gets built, um, that you'll all be interested, in, you know, and be able then to access it and get more engaged in the PCORI community. Um, Cielo is another product we developed um, with Phil Payne, um, who was at OSU at the time, but he's now over at WashU. I'm going to skip over this, but again, it's a, another tool, sort of an open science data sandbox where people can really collaborate and share not just their data products, but code, et cetera, and really um, try to increase the efficiency of the research enterprise. And then finally, to close on eGEMS, um, when we looked at the landscape of journals out there, obviously there are tons of peer-reviewed journals. Not all of them are open access. This is open access peer-reviewed. And most journals, because we publish in them, right, you know, you do your background, methods, findings, implications, right, kind of short. And we spend all our time talking about what we found. But things are changing so quickly, we felt there was a real need, and the community said there's a real need for, for us to be able to publish in peer-reviewed journals to talk about what we did not so much what we found, but what methodologic and um, des study design approaches did we take? How did we use electronic data? What was our governance strategy? What policies did we put? What did we learn about doing it? How did we use HIPAA compliant tablets for collection of patient reported outcomes? So really the how you do research with these new data streams, these new platforms. And this is what eGEMS is all about. You see we've already got over 120,000 downloads, 156 publications. Um, and it's very much focused on 
you know, how did you do your work and what did you learn about it so that you can get that published. So, um, and it's really sort of on the cutting edge. Um, and so I would encourage you to check it out. Um, and here's some, I don't know if you can read that, but the, here's the eGEMS editorial board, and you'll see hopefully some names that you're well familiar with, um, but it's a very exciting initiative for us at Academy Health. Um, so with that, let me close and just say again, trends and priorities. We see a lot of uh, innovation, a lot of stressors for the traditional health services research enterprise, but within those stressors, we see a lot of opportunity, and we're working very much with our field to try to um, help accelerate our ability to stay relevant and produce credible, rigorous evidence that improves health and health care. Thank you. So much, Dr. Simpson. So, as healthcare researchers, right, we care about three things: funding, data, and publication. So, Dr. Simpson's right, keynote right, covers all three very well. So, I'm sure that we learn a lot. And this keynote sounds like music to everyone's ears. So, now I just wonder whether anyone have any questions. I do have a bunch of. <laughs> that was an excellent presentation. I totally appreciate your reference to Dr. Burwell saying we're going to clean out you know, old uh, references and get rid of bad evidence and put best practices back in. I want to talk about what you just said, though, which is our job as health services researchers, when you go through your three things you list, is I think the fourth one is implementation. Because uh, so much stuff sits around for 15 years and doesn't grow, and uh, I'm not going to be here in 15 years working, I hope. And hopefully you're enjoying yourself in 15 years. So how do we you know, take this concept of, okay, now we understand this data and force it into action? Yeah. No, it's a great point, and it, I share your, um, what I'm hearing is sort of frustration with how long it takes to actually get our evidence into policy and practice. And so Academy Health is very focused on that. Three years ago, we launched a institute, a translation dissemination institute to try to advance the art and science of translation and dissemination um, so that we learn about different ways of doing this. Um, that's why we reached out and partnered with the National Institutes of Health for the DNI Dissemination Implementation Research Conference to learn more from that. That's why we're, we actually had contracts and worked, uh, did some reports for PCORI or, around how to do implementation better because everybody's struggling. If it were easy, we would have figured this out sooner. Um, I would say one thing that we're, we're, we talk a lot about but we haven't been able to sort of figure out what to do about it is exactly what Gordon uh, mentioned, which is the very incentives that exist in academics are barriers to implementation for all of us. Um, you know, and when people, I, as a physician by training, I always find it amazing that we want to, you know, my colleagues in economics want to use behavioral economics for patients, for doctors to change their behaviors, and they don't think about the application of behavioral economics to themselves, which is, you're a researcher at an academic institution. What if your funding was dependent on you being able to show that you made a difference? Ooh, what a concept. You know, and so funders need to be thinking differently about how they fund research. So for example, when we were doing a project funded by the Robert Johnson Foundation on research impact assessment, because other countries are further ahead than us on this very issue, um, the NSF is starting to try to move their portfolio to looking at, you know, future funding is kind of dependent on you being able to describe what you, you know, what difference your last research made, not just to the literature, but to real life. Um, but our colleagues in the UK two years ago the higher, uh, the higher education infrastructure there uh, created the next version of the research excellence framework, and 20% of the score that the academic institutions got across all sectors, business, humanities, healthcare, every part of the ins higher ed institutions, 20% of your score that, you know, that would drive then your funding allocation was based on demonstration of impact to society at some level. So boy, those institutions, they, those uh, universities start spending money on case studies and figuring out what difference they made and where could they prove that anybody paid any attention to the research that they did. 
Um, the Canadians are doing this as well, but I don't see us yet. So I think that's a big thing. And then the other issue is promotion and tenure committees. And so we hear about some P&T committees that are innovative and giving credit for not just the traditional service, but that you actually try to take your research findings and implement them, disseminate them with communities, with policymakers. But that's not traditionally valued. And so we need to focus on that as well. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, so I wanted to talk about the data use agreements where the other party is constantly interested in uh, not uh, publishing the results actually. So as a university researcher, data use agreements take a number of months and finally people actually stop um, uh, sometimes following up. So in the cases where this is successful, I realized that we were able to gap a cultural, uh, sorry, bridge a cultural gap so how can we facilitate this? Uh, it's a great question, and, and it's just, it's a reality of our environment right now because there are different, again, incentives in the private sector that drive uh, in a different way. So a couple thoughts. One is um, in the EDM repository, and this is gonna be moving into the PCOR Resource Center, we have a number of sort of uh, model governance toolkits, you know, model data use agreements, things to help promote these kinds of conversations and inform them by, you know, best practices in other places. Um, so that's what, where we're trying to provide the tools and, and learnings from settings and investigators who have been able to at least, again, bridge that cultural divide and come to a, an understanding. It's, it's still a big issue. Um, in fact, in the last year, we've had a number of researchers who are funded um, by the federal government under contract work who have come to us and said, we're really worried. You know, we've always, con you know, when you go into the contract research business, you know you're doing contract research. You know it's not an R01 in an academic. You know you're signing these things. But the constraints on publication and sharing are getting worse. Um, and these are federally funded contracts. It's not private sector contracts. So, you know, because the, the, this old adage is, you know, pharma or somebody, you know, in the private sector is constraining publication rights. But we're seeing that trend in the public sector as well. Um, one can understand, perhaps, why this is happening. This is the Affordable Care Act is a very politically charged and bitter debate. And so any desire, you know, there's great desire to show how great it is on one side and how terrible it is on the other. So any evidence that goes on one side or the other, you know, you can imagine that the people might, might want to really promote it or suppress it. So we've been talking to members of Academy Health. We're, we're working with Sarah Rosenbaum, who's a professor at GW, because she helped us before on a report about rights and publication and dissemination. And we're trying to update that guidance for, for the next administration, hoping to try to get some, um, to titrate this back to a more reasonable approach because we're very concerned about it. Thank you so much, Dr. Lisa Simpson. Um, so I know that uh, you know after you know her thought-provoking keynote, we have a lot of thinking right out of questions. So which will carry over the next two days, right? So feel free to uh, approach Dr. Simpson for further questions. We have to move on to the next item, I guess. <laughs> 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 Thank you.